everyone. Thanks. And I'd like to welcome you all to the third Society of Skeletal Radiology Resident Education Club webinar. Um, we decided uh, to name this the Resident Education Club because we really hope to build a community of skeletal radiologists, present and future, um, through, this, uh, through this venue. Uh, my name is Connie Chang, and I will be your moderating uh, moderator for this session. Just a reminder, there will be instructions on how to sign into Poll Everywhere. Um, Dr. Mills will be having a series of questions where you can participate and get to see what other people are thinking um, for the cases. So please sign on so that we can be interactive. Um, and all right, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today's session, Dr. Megan Mills. She's from the University of Utah and she is both the Chief of MSK Imaging and the Residency Associate Program Director. Um, and she uh, does all sorts of cool MSK stuff and um, I think you're gonna really, really enjoy this talk. So take it away, Megan. All right, thanks so much. And thanks to the SSR for having me. I'm uh, excited to participate in this resident education club. And thanks especially to you, Connie, for being my mentor in this. I really appreciate it. Um, so before we dive into cases, I really wanna give a broad overview of traumatic fixation. So the orthopedic surgeon absolutely has to understand these fundamentals. And this includes the biomechanics of the injury, the function of the device, and the goals of fixation. But we as radiologists also have to have a working knowledge of these same concepts. So when we as diagnosticians understand these fundamentals, we can actually better predict the potential complications. And that's how we help out our surgical colleagues. So the goals of fixation are really to return the patient to function. That's the overarching goal. And this is achieved through stabilization, restoration of alignment and maintenance of blood supply. So many of the complications that inhibit these goals, we can diagnose on imaging. So these are some of the more common complications. Uh, they're kind of broadly grouped into device failure and that can include fracture of the device or loosening or failure of the bone around the device. So these cases really depend on scrutiny of both the device and the bone. All right, so how do we approach these cases? And I'm actually gonna answer that with a case. So we're gonna start with our first poly V question. Uh, so these are the images and using poly V, I want you all to tell me where the abnormality is. And you can click right on these images. And again, that link is in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds to log on and then to go ahead and respond. I'll give everyone about, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can you give us a live update as to how many people have responded so we can try to encourage oh, sure. more people? You bet. Um, oh, I can just see the, the responses. I don't know if I can see, let's see, there Robin. we go. All right, cool. Nice, looks like we've got a variety, I love it. All right, so this is actually the abnormality and this is great because that means that we're gonna do some learning during this conference, this is perfect. So first in our approach, uh, I really like to start with the initial injury if it's available. So in our case, we're gonna start with that first injury. Uh, the reason I like to start here is because number one, it actually makes me better at diagnosing acute trauma. You're gonna see all sorts of fractures. And number two, it helps me learn those principles of fixation. I can see the type of injury and I can then see how the surgeons decide to treat it. You don't even have to read an orthopedic textbook. You can kind of glean a lot of this information just from seeing this follow-up of these cases. All right, so let's identify this injury first. So in this case, there's fracture of the medial malleolus. We can see that on these two planes here. There's fracture of the distal fibula. There's some comminution, multiple fragments, a fair amount of displacement here as well. We see the posterior malleolus fracture best on this lateral radiograph of the ankle. And you'll note that there's lots of tibio-talar subluxation. This joint is no longer congruent. Uh, this concavity really should form nicely with the convexity of the talar dome. So in summary, I would describe this as an unstable trimalleolar fracture. And this is a type of injury that requires surgical fixation or this patient is not gonna have a function of this joint. All right, 
So moving on to step two, now we're gonna see how this type of fracture is fixed. So most trimalleolar fracture fixation looks something like this. So this is a different patient. They have the same type of injury, but they've undergone a more typical uh, plate and screw fixation. You can see the fixation of the medial malleolus, the distal fibula, as well as the posterior malleolus on these images. You can tell they're right out of surgery. They still have the splint material. Makes it nice and difficult for us to try and evaluate those things, but this is a great baseline. All right, so back to our case. So what's the deal? Why did our patient get such a different type of fixation? And to answer that, we actually have to move on to our next step of evaluation, which is identifying the type of device, the type of fixation. And we need to understand how this device works, actually better understand how the device can potentially fail. So, so this is something called a calcaneal arthrodesis intramedullary nail. That's predominantly this main long metallic segment that goes all the way from the calcaneus into the distal tibia. And then the other part of this device is something called a spiral blade. And that's the part that kind of uh, traverses the most distal aspect of this intramedullary nail. So I've seen this device before, but it's usually present in patients who are severely arthritic, uh, they're osteopenic or often elderly. Um, and you may not know that, but you can appreciate that the bone density is pretty normal in this patient and none of those other factors really fit. And so something's just not quite right here. And when I'm confronted with this situation clinically, something doesn't quite make sense. I try to do some more investigating and figure out why they chose this device. Uh, so in this case, I utilized the medical record and I learned that this patient is severely schizophrenic, they're morbidly obese, and they have a high risk for non-compliance. So the orthopedic surgeons uh, chose this fixation because the clinical scenario dictated the need for a non-standard fixation. And this is an atypical clinical scenario, atypical fixation, so this is at high risk for increased complication. So moving on in our stepwise approach, we've seen our initial injury. We know a bit more about the type of fixation and now we can move on to that case, those follow-up post-operative images. So in this case, we have our immediate post-operative comparison. Again, we can tell because of the splint material. And then we have our six-week follow-up. So the immediate post-op should serve as your baseline. This is what the fixation should look like. And I highly recommend you search through the prior exams to find either the intraoperative fluoro, that's very helpful, or this immediate postoperative examination so that you can make kind of those direct comparisons. And then what are we looking for? So we wanna ensure that those surgical goals of fixation are being achieved. So we're checking that the alignment is restored, that the fracture is reduced, and then we're also evaluating for new complications such as sites of fracture in the adjacent bone. In this case, the joint subluxation has been reduced. We actually have pretty good congruence of that tibio-talar joint, and our trimalleolar fracture sites are in near anatomic alignment. So that's essentially saying that if the fracture heals like this, that the function will be restored to the patient. So the bone itself really looks okay in this case. So now we can move on to scrutinizing the hardware. Similar to the bone, we're making sure that the hardware is in appropriate alignment, uh, the hardware is not fractured or malfunctioning in some way. And when we evaluate the hardware in this case, there's not necessarily a fracture of the device itself, but the device alignment has changed. So when we look at this immediate postoperative radiographs, we can see that that spiral blade is engaged with this intramedullary nail and is flush with the posterior cortex of the calcaneus. When we look at the follow-up radiographs, we can see that this device now protrudes posteriorly from the calcaneus and no longer interlocks with that intramedullary nail. And this is concerning with loosening and is essentially a failed fixation. So I think this case offers a good overview to orthopedic implant evaluation. And when we're evaluating these post-op cases, it's really tempting to look at the follow-up images and say, looks like there's fracture healing but there's really a lot more information we can gain if we just take this holistic approach. Um, so in this single case, you've already learned what a trimalleolar fracture looks like. You've seen how it's typically fixed, what an alternate fixation might look like and how that type of device might fail. Um, so in summary, just looking at this approach. First, go back, find that initial injury. Then you can see how that an injury, injury was addressed. You can see what it was supposed to look like in the immediate post-operative setting. 
then you can start evaluating the post-operative follow-up imaging. We're looking at scrutinizing the osseous structures, and then we're looking at the device and the fixation itself. And finally, keep in mind, there's lots of special circumstances that require a non-standard approach. So if you see something unexpected or unfamiliar, try to use whatever resources you have to sort out why they chose that and what sort of complications you're looking for. All right, so that's our brief introduction with our first case. I'm happy to answer any questions people might have at this point. Yeah, so I don't see any questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to give people a few seconds to see if they want to um, enter it in. Uh, Megan, thanks for an amazing first case and giving that wonderful um, algorithm of what to follow. Um, I wonder if some people feel a little bit demoralized almost because, um, uh, uh, as you said, it's important to know what the routine fixation is, and that's... Um, something that just requires time and experience, which obviously you have a lot of. So um, for those of you residents out there who are just starting out, don't feel down, you know, take, try to take a whole bunch of these uh, radiographs and get a sense of, you know, in a single body part, what is normal and what isn't. And I think you made some really great points about um, looking at that immediate post-op film as your comparison. Don't just go one back, go like 10 back even, or whatever that first one is. I, th I think that's a great point. All right, I see some questions, so I'm gonna shift over there, although I think they're in the chat, hold on. Um, so first question, do you comment on hardware alignment and fracture fragment alignment separately? I guess my question is, this is a good question, <laughs> you know, cause we use the word alignment, is the, does the word alignment refer to the bone or does it refer to the hardware or both? Or how do you make that clear in your reports, Megan? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I do, in a sense, comment on both, but my wording may differ a little bit. You're absolutely right. So um, my typically my typical dictation says something like, you know, open reduction internal fixation of a whatever fracture in their anatomic alignment. Or if there's persistent displacement, I'll say there's persistent displacement and describe it. And then I'll say there's no hardware complications. And that to me is a, a broad umbrella term for saying the hardware is intact. I don't see signs of loosening. I don't see signs of other complication. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I think um, I think uh, when you're just starting off, it's better probably to list all those separate complications. Um, and then later on, when you get more pro, you know, then you can start summarizing them because sometimes saying it over and over again is a good reminder for yourself and also makes sure um, and lets your attending know that you've got that checklist in your head and you're looking at all those things. Totally agree. Having that more detail at the beginning is certainly a great approach. And then you slowly hone it down, down over time. But you're always still checking those same things off of the list. Exactly. It just becomes more automatic. <laughs> Definitely. All right. So we don't have any questions right now. So why don't we okay. move on to the next great. case, Megan? All right. So there's going to be some more unknown cases. This is uh, a lot of pulley EV for you guys. And I made this case more difficult. I'm actually not gonna give you the original injury or the immediate post-op. But in real life, sometimes you actually don't get that information. And so you're kind of forced to deduce what the injury was and what the post-operative imaging should have looked like. Um, I chose this case first because we've seen this injury already. This is another trimalleolar fracture. You've also seen what that typical fixation should look like. And I'll give you a hint, it shouldn't look like this. So it's your turn. Um, here comes that pulley V question, this time multiple choice. What complication is present in this case? All right, and your options are fracture, septic loosening, aseptic loosening, or avascular necrosis. I'll give you a few more seconds and then I'll show you those responses. and see what your cohort's choosing. I like this. We've got a good race for septic loosening and avascular necrosis. And in this particular case, this is septic loosening. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So hardware loosening in general can be from continued motion across a fracture. And we often call that mechanical loosening or aseptic loosening, or it can be caused by infection. And we refer to that as septic loosening. And the imaging findings are actually similar in both. 
Um, the differentiation is largely clinical. And I didn't give you any clinical information that certainly could have helped you in this case. Um, there are a few imaging clues that will help you distinguish between septic and aseptic loosening though. So overall, when we're evaluating for hardware loosening, we're really scrutinizing the bone immediately adjacent to the fixation. And when we're looking for two major things, lucency around the hardware or change in hardware alignment. So the residents always ask me, well, how much lucency matters? You know, and it's two millimeters, it's always two millimeters in MSK. Um, but in this case, you can see that those lucent halos, this is adjacent to those syndesmotic fixation screws. It's really evident at the screw tip, but when we scrutinize this a little bit closer, you can see it's all the way adjacent to the entire course of the screw. So in this instance, we actually have findings that point us more towards a diagnosis of septic loosening. So we can even be a little bit more specific in this case. We actually see erosion of the joint space and it does look a lot like avascular necrosis. So I can see why people would say that. But we also have some periosteal reaction. There's tons of soft tissue swelling, probably a joint effusion in there as well. And those are all findings of bone and joint infection. So that helps push us more towards a diagnosis of septic loosening. All right, I wanna show you a companion case. I'll give you a second to look at that. No pull EV question for this one though. Again, I usually put this immediate post-operative radiograph here uh, on the left for comparison and then the follow-up images here. So this is an example of mechanical or aseptic loosening. So we're gonna use our baseline, our immediate post-op, and compare that with our follow-up and see what changes there are. So in addition to the lucency adjacent to the screws in this case, you can see that they've changed an alignment. So these screw heads really should be flush with the medial malleolus. You can see that's how they were in this immediate post-operative radiograph, but they have changed the alignment. And this is definitely consistent with loosening because there's no other way for these screws to pull out like this. You'll also know that we see the fracture much better on this follow-up and that's because there's increased displacement across this fracture. So this mechanical loosening of the hardware resulted in failure to restore this anatomic alignment. And this patient is unlikely to heal this fracture without further intervention. In fact, these screws may displace even more if they don't intervene. All right, back to our pull EV question. Give you a second to look at this. And the question this time, true or false, this fixation is adequate. If you think that's the case, pick true. If not, false. It's like we've got about 11 responses. I'll show you what the group is thinking so far as those continue to roll in. Looks like we have a lot of uh, multiple choice uh, test takers because there's a, a lot of uh, test taking skills associated with true false questions, right? So yeah, most of you are absolutely correct. This is a hardware complication lecture, right? Why would I show you a normal one? <laughs> <laughs> so this fixation is not adequate, all right? This is going to require further intervention in order to restore function. But let's go back to that stepwise approach and see if we can sort out why, okay. So again, have to deduce what happened to this patient. You don't have a prior. What was the type of injury? Well, we can see the fracture pretty clearly here. This was an intertrochanteric femoral neck fracture. And then we can identify our fixation. We see part of an intramedullary nail here as well as a hip screw. So when we evaluate the hardware, there's not any adjacent lucency. There's no fracture of the hardware, but this intertrochanteric fracture is not in anatomic alignment. And this becomes more apparent if we understand how this device works. So this hip screw, this component of the fixation is designed to telescope in and out of this intramedullary nail. In fact, you can see this kind of oval within the metal that allows that uh, to translate in and out of the intramedullary nail. And this is on purpose. So this fracture actually has to have some degree of compression in order to heal. Um, the screw tip in these cases should also be centered in this femoral head. But in this case, this is too much compression. The screw has actually backed out quite a bit uh, from the intramedullary nail. And the screw tip is eccentrically located within the femoral head. So there's relatively little fracture opposition. Uh, there's a little bit of valgus and there's lots of problems here. Unlikely to heal, even if they do heal, they're probably gonna have problems with this. So, this device is now aligned and it introduces another important concept and that's you have to image the whole implant. 
so we actually just imaged the proximal aspect of this when this patient initially came into the emergency room. But when we image the distal aspect of the fixation, we can see this bicortical screw is now only engaging one cortex instead of two, and it's at an abnormal angle. So this screw is supposed to be perpendicular to this intramedullary nail and really lock it into place. And when the distal screw fails like this, the whole construct, the intramedullary nail, as well as the, the hip screw can actually translate distally. So the true issue in this case is actually this bicortical screw failure that allowed this proximal fracture to become malaligned. Okay, companion case. And this is gonna be a pulley V question for you guys as well. I'll give you the whole implant, not trying to be tricky here. So same question though, true or false, this fixation is adequate. All right, let's see what the group is thinking. Going with those test taking strategies. All right, the 11% of you like it. So this is a gotcha case and I'm glad I got you guys to say false. Um, so if we're seeing the fixation is not adequate, we are essentially communicating to the surgeon that this patient needs another operation or they're not gonna have function, all right? But you're gonna tell me there's an obvious fracture. This is just like the last case. There's displacement of this bicortical screw. There's a fracture of the proximal interlocking screw and you're, you're absolutely right. But one thing to keep in mind is that the biomechanics of the injury in this case are different. This is a femoral diaphyseal fracture. And this fracture is actually in near anatomic alignment. There's some displacement, but it's not angulated. It's not overlapped or foreshortened. So while it's never ideal to have hardware fracture, it's not an automatic indication for surgical revision. So when I'm dictating these cases, I absolutely alert the surgeon that there's a problem, right? You have some screw fractures, but it's just as important to note that the fracture reduction remains adequate, right? Back to those fundamentals of fixation. And just to prove I'm not making this up, this is four weeks later, they didn't revise this patient. Uh, you can see that there's some signs of healing and it really hasn't changed alignment. All right, questions so far? So I'm looking in the chat. I don't see any right now. I love how people are participating. Oh, yeah. Poly -V, so they're participating uh, with the questions um, through the chat box. Um, doesn't look like anybody has anything burning right now. Um, why don't we move on to the next yeah. case and if we get some questions along the way? Absolutely. Okay, more poly V questions. So this is actually gonna be a series of poly V questions. All of these are the same patients and they're kind of all set up the same. This is like the prior radiograph and then this is the follow up. So first one, click on the abnormality. All right, let's see what people are thinking. Oh, we got lots of concentration right in here. All right, very good. Uh, this is an abnormality in this case. We're gonna talk more about it, but I'm gonna show you another poly EB case. So just a little bit bigger, and then I'll answer, open up the question. So this is the same patient again. This is their post-op revision, and then this is a follow-up 12 days later. Okay, to you guys. Click on the abnormality. All right, let's see where those responses are. Love it, you guys are doing awesome. Okay, same patient, same setup. They revised the patient again, and then they had a follow-up radiograph six weeks later. Okay, open that up for polling. 
click on the abnormality, and then we'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. Nice, you all did wonderful in this case. All right, lots to unpack here. So let's go back to that first kind of post-operative uh, follow-up film. Um, this is a dynamic hip screw. And I've seen this fixation a lot. They usually use it for basy cervical or mid femoral neck fractures, all right? And there's issues from the outset, right? Probably most obvious is there's a fracture immediately adjacent to the fixation. And fractures of the native bone, this is often where they happen because it's an interface where you have kind of a strong metallic component with bone, right? Metal's gonna win in that situation. There's some other complications on this one as well. Um, one thing to note is the angulation of this screw. Now, regardless of what projection you're looking at a screw in radiographically, it should be straight. So anytime you have this acute angulation, um, it should raise suspicion that there's a screw fracture. Even if you don't see the discrete screw fracture, this angulation is concerning. And in addition, it might be hard to see in the zoom, but there's some lucency adjacent to this dynamic hip screw. And so there's also findings of some chronic loosening. All right, so not surprising, this got revised. And after the second fixation, sorry, go ahead. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Is it common for your surgeons to, because it seems like that lateral plate is very short. Um, it is, is that, short. Is this is not, this came from outside and I'm, okay. it was pretty old fixation. And so oh, I think this patient had had an old fixation. This is, you're absolutely right, Connie, not the typical approach for a subcapital or basy cervical fracture anymore. They tend to do the gamma nails, which are these short intramedullary nails or even a mm -hmm. long intramedullary nail now. Um, but this was an older fixation um, from somewhere else. So I can blame somebody else. Oh, okay. Yeah, because I have not seen that before. So I was surprised. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a weird one for sure. So that got fixed, right? This looks like a disaster. So they put in the intramedullary nail across the fracture site. They lock it in place with these screws. And then we can see definite change in alignment, right? The surgeons don't put the screws through the distal end of the femoral head. Uh, this is gonna cause a lot of problems or range of motion absolutely has to be revised. And so screw loosening here needs revision. And then after the third revision, Again, we see that change in alignment of the hardware. You have one screw that's backing out, one screw that's actually telescoping into the joint. Not only do we have loosening of the hardware, but now we have a fracture of the subcapital femoral neck. Again, you can see there's a fracture fragment that's no longer fixated. These screws are articulating with the acetabular cartilage, big problem. So these are pretty much all of the complications we've seen so far in one unfortunate patient uh, this patient got an arthroplasty, which is kind of the last ditch effort to restore function of the joint. All right, and then I'm gonna switch gears real quick and then we'll get, get back to a question session. So this is gonna be another polyvi case, a little bit of history. This is a patient who is in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, this is nine months after they had fixation of this femoral biathecial fracture. Okay, turn it over to you all. So what complication is present in this case? And your options are aseptic loosening, septic loosening, non-union, or avascular necrosis. And can I ask you, uh, how, what is the time course between the original fracture and uh, this, this, this radiograph? This was nine months out, nine months after okay. surgery. All right, thank you. For sure. Okay, let's see what everybody's thinking here. Wow, strong work. Everybody got that, I'm impressed. We could just skip this section. <laughs> now, hopefully we'll have some, some tips I can share with you about non-union. Um, so this is actually not a diagnosis that's made lightly because this diagnosis should prompt surgical revision. And so by definition, Non-union is gonna be a fracture that just doesn't heal and it won't heal unless somebody goes in and revises the fixation. So there is some controversy about when the diagnosis of non-union can be made, right? Cause you're kind of forcing a surgeon to do something about it. Um, most people are gonna agree that if a fracture hasn't healed by six to nine months, and if there hasn't been any progress in the last three months of that, that this fracture is not gonna heal. 
but there's clinical factors that may impact that, all right? So this is both a clinical and an imaging diagnosis. So some of those clinical factors can be age or bone health, and they're part of that equation. I've seen fractures and little old ladies who have awful bone that heal after a year or several years. Um, so be careful when you're kind of making that hard diagnosis of non-union, make sure that you have the whole clinical picture. So there's also different types of non-union. Um, I tell my residents that bone's not the smartest organ. It can only make more bone or less bone. And so you get both of those patterns when in non-union cases. Uh, if you're not making enough bone, we call that either oligotrophic or atrophic non-union. The distinction there is if there's blood supply that's still um, somewhat intact. Uh, so this case is that. It's kind of an oligotrophic non-union. There's not a lot of bone formation in here. We have a lot of bone loss. So here's another case, just a companion case. No poly V question this time. This is a tibial diaphyseal fracture. We have another intramedullary nail. We can see those proximal and distal interlocking screws in this instance. And this is a CT that was done about the same time. So this patient is 10 months out. So they're in that window of concern, right? Where we're starting to think about non-union and there's incomplete fracture healing. It's so much easier to see on the CT. And CTs are very helpful in these cases because the hardware itself may be obscuring part of the bone that is indeed healing. But when we look at it on CT, we see a fracture plane all the way across. We don't see any central bridging. And in this case, there's lots of extra bone. We see peripheral callus. Uh, we see lots of sclerosis. And this is a more typical picture of hypertrophic nonunion. All right, I'm gonna show you one more case and then we'll have um, some time for Q and A here. So this is a patient who's six weeks post-op and your poly EV question is coming. So click on the abnormality or I give you the option to call this normal if you want. All right, let's see what people are thinking. I like it. I love the variety of responses. It's the good cases then. All right. So somebody's all over it. Chance to kind of talk about this a little bit more. So let's work through this, okay. Um, I'm gonna show you the same patient. These are the images you just saw. This is that patient two years later, okay. Might be a little bit more evident what the complication is now, but let's work through it. All right, so our stepwise approach. Here's our initial injury. We've got a mortise and a lateral view of our ankle. We can see that there's lots going on here. This is not the normal alignment of your hind foot. And we can see that there's lucency irregularity here right across uh, the Taylor body or Taylor neck. And this is a vertical fracture right through the Taylor neck. And it actually is causing some dislocation of that subtalar articulation. Now, if I say Taylor neck fracture, a little red flag should go up in your mind <laughs> because this type of fracture is prone to complication. And that's because it has a complex and a partially retrograde blood supply. And if you disrupt blood supply to a fracture, it can cause complications and fixation because of avascular necrosis. So that's what we're looking at here. So this is the CT and the radiograph a year out, right? We can see that there's lots of increased sclerosis of this talus. There's fragmentation and collapse of that talar dome. But hopefully there's one other little red flag going up in your mind. And that's when we're making a diagnosis of AVN in the talus, there's a pitfall that we need to be aware of. So let's go back, six weeks radiograph post-op. Because at two years, the cat's out of the bag. There's nothing they can do about that, right? That talus is dead. But could we have done something and made a diagnosis here at six weeks? So this is one of the more challenging things in radiology, right? And that's realizing that something is not present that should be there. So I wanted to draw your attention to the bone mineralizations patient. This is a pretty young patient. And overall, the bone mineral density is decreased. We can see that in the calcaneus, there's loss of that normal trabecula. You can see some, uh, some decrease or some lucency in regions of the physeal scar. Um, and this is expected, right? This patient is not walking around on this, but they have lots of hyperemia going on because the body is trying to heal this fracture. But what you'll note is not present is osteopenia in the Taylor dome. In fact, this is relatively sclerotic 
when you compare it to the adjacent bones. There should be similar subchondral lucency of this Taylor dome. That's something called the Hawkins sign. You may have heard about that before. But when it's not present, that should alert us to the fact that the blood supply is already compromised in this case. So good case of AVN. All right, looks like we got a couple of questions now. Yeah, why don't we, um, they go all the way back to the femoral shaft. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you, you want to scroll back? Maybe we can look at all the cases again. Yeah, so sure. um, going back to that femoral shaft case, um, somebody brings up a really good question about um, the fact that there's only one view shown on that image. So do you feel, is it just because of this case and the hardware or, or did you, and you just didn't have space to show it or, you know, are you okay in this particular case saying the alignment is fine with only the single view? That's a good, good question. I like to say one view is no view. <laughs> and even though we have two images on this case, it's not an orthogonal view. So there was a lateral radiograph in this case. I just didn't have enough room to cram it in there. But you're absolutely right. You should be evaluating that alignment on all of your views. Um, this degree of displacement, right? We have kind of a cortex width of displacement is probably okay. Um, but yes, you definitely want to evaluate that on multiple views. Did you have further follow-up? Did, did this fracture end up healing well? It did heal. This patient did okay. So it was one of those where it was like, oh, the hardware doesn't look good. And they decided to just watch it and it progressed to healing. So they did fine. Great. Awesome. All right. So the next case I think was... Um, oh yeah, I can get to that here. I think it's the... the yeah. So uh, one question for this... Um, uh, about what the word dynamic means in the, for a dynamic hip screw. What, what, is, what does that mean? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it just means that it has some motion component to it, right? So this is a screw that doesn't move when it's engaged in this femoral cortex, but this component of it is actually a separate piece from this kind of short uh, femoral plating here. So it comes in two pieces and that allows this screw to again, kind of cannulate or telescope in and out of the rest of this plate and allow for that fracture compression. So just like with our intramedullary nail and screw fixation, same concept. They're just trying to get some compression across the fracture here. Um, and so that's what dynamic means. It means it's allowed for some motion. That's compared to some of these like more uh, cortical and plate screws, right? They're not supposed to move at all. So dynamic just implies that there's motion, but it's expected. Right, exactly. So, uh, you know, the end of that on the lateral end, sometimes you'll see part of the screw come out a little because there's been some compression and um, um, sometimes, you know, the, the fracture will be even a little varus because of the compression. And that's okay as long as it's, it's still not hasn't moved too much and it's stable. So just because that's just in these screws, if they're a little bit of backing out occurs, it's not really backing out. It looks like backing out, but it's, it's really just compression and that's fine. So, um, okay, this, this is a great question. So uh, actually we have a question all the way back to your septic um, uh, necrosis, uh, the, the septic joint and the septic hardware. Okay. So um, uh, how can you tell the difference between aseptic and uh, aseptic loosening and septic loosening? Oh, and, and especially in a patient with a, a neuropathic joint. Oh man, yeah, that's hard. It's definitely hard. So um, the clinical piece I think really sways you in those cases, right? If somebody has a septic joint, especially one that's you know causing hardware loosening, like they should be sick. That's a red inflamed joint with fever. Um, ultimately, sometimes you have to stick a needle in it and make a diagnosis and try and get a culture. Connie loves that approach because she gets to use a needle. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so that is, that is like the answer, right? Stick a needle in it. The imaging findings, you're still including probably septic and aseptic loosening in most of these cases. It's just sometimes we have those radiographic or CT or MRI changes of bone infection. And so then we can say, okay, I'm leaning more towards a septic loosening as opposed to an aseptic loosening, but the imaging is not definitive to distinguish the two. I completely agree with that. Even sometimes the physical exam isn't, um, like because sometimes people with neuropathic joints, there can be deformity and, you know, it, they look, they, the skin can be irritated, especially in the feet. If you go back to the case that you, could you show that tibia Taylor, um, the trimalleolar fracture with the tibia Taylor? Yeah. So uh, can we go back to the, the, the ankle? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Here we go. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Yeah, there, there, you go, go. there you go. It's this. So I think, you know, the thing that struck out, stuck out to me immediately was sort of like the periarticular osteopenia, because you definitely can have like debris and the erosions, you know, in a neuropathic joint, but that, that osteopenia that occurs in an infection, um, like that focal periarticular osteopenia isn't as common in, in a chronically neuropathic joint. Um, again, I think you're absolutely right. In a lot of cases, you're going to end up sticking a needle in it anyway. But this case in particular, and there's not much debris here either. Um, it, it just sticks out to me that, that that degree of osteopenia and those erosions just kind of stick out to me um, as findings that kind of push this more towards septic arthritis and an infection. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, okay, we've still got a few more questions. So let's go through... Uh, okay, so down, back to the non-union case. If you're concerned for a non-union, do you hedge and suggest the possibility or do you let the clinician actually make the diagnosis since there are, there are other factors that can affect it? Oh man, I have to talk about my degree of hedging uh, on a recorded conference. This is gonna <laughs> be great. <laughs> that is, that's totally a fair question. So my approach, if I don't have any background clinical information, right? Patients coming to me from you know outside hospital, I don't have any prior imaging, there's not a lot of clinical notes or whatever, it is to be less definitive in those cases, right? So even if I have the history, it's like this is you know nine months out from fixation. Um, if I see any of those clinical features, which may be more of a delayed union, and we didn't talk about that, but that's kind of the step down from non-union. It's it's that there's there is some healing, it's just not healing as fast as it should, right? Um, if I see some of those features, like the patient's horrifically osteopenic, you know, they're elderly, uh, maybe it's not a weight bearing bone, so the bone's not being stressed to heal very much, then I may might, might back that down a little bit. And sometimes I like to say there's incomplete fracture healing or less, for, less healing response than I would expect given the time course. So those are both phrases that I'll use in imaging. Um, there are certainly cases that our surgeons fix, right, that we do, they don't want us to call them non-union because they want to continue to kind of manage that patient conservatively. Those are usually like really complicated patients um, that are going to need a huge surgery and a huge revision. So understandably, they want to wait as long as they can to make sure that they need to do a revision. Um, so yes, I do end up hedging in those cases, but when you have that kind of hypertrophic appearance in particular, and it's like completely sclerosed across the fracture, it's not going to heal. And so you can, you can be pretty confident in those cases. Yeah, I, I completely agree. There's another related question that says, how many views do you need to see lack of osseous cross bridging to diagnose non-union on radiography? Can be um, tough. Oh yeah. And it depends on where it is. So honestly, we end up getting CT in a lot of those cases. So almost every non-union case will get a CT before they go on to revision, especially in the long bones, right? So femur, tibia, humerus, all of those are, it's much harder to see that degree of osseous bridging, especially because you have all that hardware in the way. So we try to use some of those fancy CTs that, that help with the, the um, streak artifact and kind of reduce a lot of the artifact um, so that we can better see how much bridging is present. Um, and I think one last question, somebody asked, um, you know, about um, how you know a hip screw is dynamic. And I think at the end of the day, Megan, how do you, how did you get to know all this hardware? Is there a good resource out there? Did you just talk to a lot of orthopedic surgeons? You, I don't know, you went to orthopedic fairs and, you know, played with all the <laughs> hardware. Like what was, what was, what's a good way maybe, you know, our residents um, can, can study up on this hardware? <laughs> I think one of the most intimidating things about hardware is there's just not one great resource out there. And um, that's partially because this is always changing. So when I was a resident, I remember thinking like, gosh, why doesn't somebody just put this in an atlas? You know, we could just Google it and look, look it up and see what it was. But there's like every day, there's some sort of new orthopedic implant. And so it's impossible to really, um, to know them all by name, right? But a lot of them have kind of the same concepts to them. And so uh, you certainly over time, after you see a bunch of these fixations, start to glean that. In addition, honestly, when I see something I don't know, which happens, you know, it happens more frequently than you might expect being even 10 years out into practice. 
um, I go back to the operative note. And in the operative note, the surgeons will say, you know, this is a whatever, you know, kind of implant from this manufacturer. And you don't need to know it to that level of detail. Um, but it will give you an idea of, of what that implant is. And then you can go look that up specifically and see from the manufacturer how it's supposed to work and what it's supposed to look like, et cetera. So, um, but I do talk to the surgeons a lot too. They're a wonderful resource. They're the ones that are using this thing. They chose it for a particular reason and they're gonna be able to tell you all about it. Cool. Yeah, I find that the orthopods really like to talk about their hardware, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. They'd probably be stoked if you went and asked them about hardware. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, uh, we're out of time. So thank you so much, uh, Megan. That was an amazing talk and a whirlwind. Um, and uh, thank you to the audience for all your participation. We really appreciate that. We love hearing back from you. And um, if you have additional questions, please also continue to reach out to us. And of course, please join us on December 15th for the next talk. It's gonna be by Dr. Corey Ho from the University of Colorado. He's going to explore the world of image guided uh, spine injections. So if you think that um, you might be interested in doing uh, MSK interventions, this is kind of a great um, entry point to learning a little bit more about that. So we hope to see you there and thanks so much for joining us once again. Thank you all.